reading God's word, knowing God's word is absolutely essential in what God desires to do in you in transforming your life. And that's what we're after. We're not after just a yes and amen to what God has done through his son and Jesus Christ. We're after a yes and amen to the life that he's desired to bring us into today. Like, that's salvation. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Not that I'm going to go to heaven one day or get brought back home one day. It's, it's the very fact that I can start eternal living today. Salvation starts the moment you accept Christ Jesus as your Lord, and you say, okay, now what does it look like to live an impossible life with a God who've, who's created everything? What does it look like now to live in this divine favor that God has made available through his son today and receive the blessings And just the, when I say the blessings, honestly, the biggest blessing is just knowing him, (laughs) is being in his presence. And that is something I think that we overlook sometimes in the church, uh, this fact of like, God is with you today in Christ. But like, really, how big that is, that God is with you. The God who's created everything is with you. For me, sometimes, I, I, yeah, I get that, but I, I lose the weightiness of it. God is with us in Christ. This is something that people have longed for. And it's available in Jesus. It's available in Christ Jesus. I'm going to start us off with a verse here. We'll get going. Uh, can you pull up Hebrews 4.16, please? Uh, the writer of Hebrew writes this. He says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in a time of need. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. This is, let us then with confidence draw near to the presence of God and into the presence of God so that we may receive mercy and find grace. That's that last part right there, the finding grace, is something the Lord has been speaking to me. Find the grace. Find the grace. Find the grace. Find the grace. Did you know that grace is available today? We've probably heard that. Grace is like God's divine favor, his his, uh, his blessings upon us, his ability to do something in our lives that we could not do on our own, that's grace. Um, there's different definitions of grace, but um, it's available, but that doesn't mean it's like we, we, we automatically receive it. So for instance, you know, God's grace is available through Christ Jesus and salvation is available. That's, that's God's grace that, that we can be delivered into an eternal life now. We can be delivered from sin and death into eternal life. It's available, but we have to do something to actually enter into it. We have to believe. So although grace is here today, you got to find it. you you, you got to accept it. It's just that last part in there that we would find grace that I feel the Lord speaking to us right now as, as a church, as a group, um, that it's, it's something to go after. The favor of God is something to go after. The grace of God is something to go after. It's available to us, but you got to go get it. Let's go get it, guys. Um, and I'm not, I don't have the time to tell you what I don't mean by that. Um, I'm not saying it's all based on works. I'm not saying that you have to earn your way into God's grace. It's not it. What I am saying, it does require a yes on our end. It does require something on our end. God's job is to do the impossible. His job is to make it available and to give us something that we could never earn. That would be grace. But it is our job to say yes to what he said. It is our job to believe. It is our job to have faith. It is our job to step out on what he has said us and called us to do. I have to, I have to do that. He's not going, he, God's not going to change my mind. Like I have, to, I have to say yes to the thoughts that I know are true, 
that he has spoken, I have to say yes to those things. Like last night, um, Danny is just so lovingly, you know, I needed this. She's like, your mind's in the wrong place. You're focusing on the lack, and you're not focusing actually on the abundance. You're looking at the wrong thing. And I, I wasn't mad at that. I'm like, thank you for telling me this. Like, you're so right. I need, I need to, I need, I need that reminder that I have to be looking at the things that God is saying and doing and what he has spoken, and I have to look at what's available versus the lack that is not there. This is what Jesus said to his disciples. He says, why do you reason with yourselves that you have no bread? This is after he fed thousands. After he performed a miracle, then they're complaining that they don't have any bread later. And he's like, why, why, why is the first thing that your mind goes to is the lack that you don't have? Did you not see what I've done? And so why I'm saying this is because this is, this is my job and your job to be able to fix our mind on the things that God has said to be true. God's not going to do that for you. There's a helper in this, the Holy Spirit, that can help you, encourage you. But it's your job to, to believe. It's your job to pursue those thoughts. It was my job last night to pursue what was there instead of what wasn't there. Does that make sense? That's my, God wasn't going to do that for me. I had to do it. I had to, I had to find the grace. And the good news is, because of Jesus, I can go to God freely. I can go to God with an open door, and he's like, cannot wait. I've been waiting for you to come in, because this is where you belong. You ought to have the confidence that you can enter in and ask me anything, and I will share with you. I will give you the mercy that you need, and you'll be able to find the grace that is needed right now in this moment for you. I got that for you, but it's because you came in. It's because you came into the throne of grace. I want to look at Moses with you guys. Um, this is a, many of you know uh, about Moses, and it's so funny, you know, when we, when we hear about some of these big figures in God's word, um, the, these wonderful men, women that have walked with God and done wonderful things, sometimes we just have these, like, um, this vision. It's a, a very kind of like narrow-sighted vision of just like, oh, Moses, he, he uh, led them, he led the Israelites out of slavery and into the promised land. Like he, they, you know, through God, what God did through him was he parted the Red Sea. Okay, wow. You know, and that's kind of like all we, sometimes we, we think about. Um, but Moses was a man, and I want to look at uh, an aspect of his life. I don't want to, I'm not going to look at the entire uh, scope of his life, but I do want to hone in on just one bit of his life here, and this is going to be found at the very beginning of Exodus. And uh, there's going to be some learning in here for us as the Lord is working in my heart regarding some things in this. But just to give you kind of a bit of a background on Moses, and again, this is not the entire landscape of his life. There's a lot I'm, I will be missing out on as I share this with you, but just to kind of give you a snapshot into where we're going to go this morning. Moses uh, was an Israelite. He's a Hebrew man. Um, he, was, he, was, he was born as a Hebrew. And what happened at that time, the Israelites were in slavery to Egypt, okay? Egypt, this big, massive powerhouse, uh, had these Israelites as their slaves, and the Pharaoh at that time was getting a bit concerned that the Israelites were growing in number, and he was a bit concerned that they might try to overthrow Egypt or become like a threat because they were growing in such numbers. So what the Pharaoh did was he said, what I want to do is I want to send out uh, this decree that uh, every firstborn male of the Israelites needs to be killed. So that was what happened. And at this time, Moses was just born, and his mother hid him away so that that wouldn't happen. Pharaoh's daughter finds this baby and essentially takes this baby in as their own. So you have this boy Moses, which means drawn out of water. That's what Pharaoh's daughter named him. Uh, you have this boy who is an Israelite, and yet he is raised within royalty, of the Egyptians. So he's, he's kind of got this like a very interesting dynamic uh, in his life. It's kind of like he's, he's in between two worlds. He's, he's this Israelite, uh, his people who are, are, are enslaved. They, all they know is slavery. I mean, really, at this point, they, they've been enslaved when he was born close to 300 years. And it's like that's all they knew. But yet he was raised as royalty. And it's almost like he didn't fit in anywhere. You know, it was hard to fit into the Egyptian household that he was in, Pharaoh's household, just because he, he, he wasn't an Egyptian. He was an Israelite. And it's tough to fit in as an Israelite because, you know, I'm, I'm over here. I, I, I'm not, 
I'm not banging stone like you guys are. You know, I'm, 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 I'm very privileged. And so we get some insight into Moses' life here, which is pretty cool. He's got this heart of just justice as he grows older. He is raised in Pharaoh's household, so he's got the wisdom. He's got the, 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 the training, the physical training for battle. So he's just very, very well equipped. And what happens one day is he goes out and he sees that uh, one of the Egyptian taskmasters was beating one of the Israelites unjustly. And so what he did was he looks left, he looks right, sees that no one's looking, and then he takes this Egyptian taskmaster, task, taskmaster down. He kills him, okay? And Pharaoh finds out, or let, let, me, let me back up. So next day, uh, he goes out again, and he sees two of the Israelites arguing. And he goes to the one Israelite who is wrong, who, who is in the wrong, and he tries to correct him. He rebukes him, and then that guy fi fires back and says, hey, look, I saw what you did yesterday. You, you killed the Egyptian. What, are you going to try to kill me now? Are you going to do that to me now? And Moses is thinking, like, oh, shoot, like, I thought no one saw that. <laughs> and so he is hit with this, uh-oh, kind of fear moment, and Pharaoh finds out about it and sets out to kill Moses. So Moses flees. He's out. He's, out. He's, he's gone. He goes to this place called Midian, and it's in the wilderness, and he finds himself at this well, and this priest has got these daughters, and these daughters go to the well to draw water, the same well that Moses is at, and these shepherds enter in at the same time. They kick these women out, and Moses stands up for them. He stands up for these women he doesn't know. He's got this just heart. He wants to do what's right. And so um, he helps these ladies out, gets the flock fed, and these girls go back to their father and say, my gosh, you know, this man helped us out, really, you know, did us a big service. And the father's like, where's he at? Bring him home. Let's, let's get him to eat with us. And so Moses comes to this man's house. This man gives him a daughter. Moses marries this daughter. Moses has a kid. Moses now is in this foreign land, a married man. He's, he's got a kid at this point in time. He had a couple sons. But he's also looking after this man, this priest, this father-in-law's flock. So now he's doing honest work. He's got this crazy past that he's fled from. He's always kind of felt like he's in between two worlds. He's kind of been struggling with his own identity. We know that Moses had a father, but we don't know too much about his father's story. It leads me to believe that Moses really didn't have a father figure in his life. And what comes that? Some identity issues. He didn't have somebody speaking who he was. So you got Moses... This man who's fled, he's in this space now, this minute, it's almost like a fresh start. Got a wife, kid, good, honest responsibility looking after the flock. I'm good. Life seems to be good right now. But I believe in Moses' heart, he's still searching for something. He's still searching for a, just something else. And I think if we are honest, guys, I think no matter where you're at, I feel like if we're honest with ourselves, we're always searching for something else. I'm not talking about we're searching for a new savior. We're not searching for, you know, a new source of life. What I am saying is I believe if we're getting honest with ourselves, there's something in us that is searching for a little bit, maybe more joy, maybe a little bit more peace, maybe a little bit more sense of uh, understanding in our purpose and our calling, a little bit more. Maybe we're searching for a little bit more of, of God's presence to be revealed to us. We're searching. And now Moses at this time is about 80 years old, guys. As I run up the narrative to us here, I mean, for most 80-year-olds in our culture, you're retired, you're good. You know, you're settled. Your life is, is, is what it is. Good run. But God does something here which is amazing. This is, this is when he starts to call Moses. 
at this age. And so now we're going to pick up the narrative here in uh, chapter 2, verse 23. Let me grab my Bible. Okay. 23 of chapter 2. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. So this time, Moses is in Midian, and the people of Israel, the Israelites, are crying up to God because of the position that they're in. Guys, this didn't just happen either. They've, they've been in, in slavery for centuries. What I love is that this, as, as Scripture records here, God saw the people of Israel and God knew. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. God sees what's happening in your life and he knows. You've been crying out to God in the quietness of your own heart. God sees what's happening and he knows. He knows. He knows what's going on. He knows what's going on in your heart. Verse 1 of chapter 3. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of God appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their task massacre taskmasters, I will get that word right before the end of this day, uh, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And then Moses goes on to argue with God that he's not the guy. I've got a speech impediment. And God's like, I made your mouth. Don't tell me, don't give me excuses. Like, I know what I'm dealing with. I know your frame. I know how I've made you. We've talked often in this house about how God calls the least likely to accomplish a task that is far greater than what they could ever do on their own. The same is true today. He is calling the least likely among us to do things that we feel like we have the ceiling's already there. And God says, I'm going to rip the ceiling off and, and I'm going to show you my goodness and my power as I work through you to accomplish what my heart and my mission is. Did you know that God's mission then is still the same 
mission, so to speak, today, and that is to bring deliverance to his people. This call on Moses' life wasn't so that, oh, Moses, so that you will be so blessed, that you will have everything your heart has desired. No, he's like, I heard, I heard my people's cry, and I know what's going on. And I'm going to take you over here, who's good, who's good in life. He's got the good job. He's got family. He's got some security. You're good. No, you're not. It's good for that time, but now there's more. With God, there's always more. And he says, I'm actually going to take you, and you're going to partake in delivering my people. I just love how God hears and knows what's happening in the hearts of others, and he calls other people from left field to partner with him to help bring deliverance. I believe that God is calling you out of left field to come and help and deliver somebody from the trials and the struggles and the mindset of anxiety and fear and sin that they're dealing with. See, that's the salvation that's due today. That's how God, God's happy to deliver people like that. <laughs> and he's looking for people to say yes. What I love about Moses, too, is the very fact that I said he's got, he's, in, it, Scripture doesn't say this, but I'm just kind of like reading into it a bit, and I just have to imagine he's got to be good. Like, he's got to be at, at this point where it's like, I, I, I'm established. I'm about 80 years old. I've got, you know, I got family. I feel good in this space. I feel like I have purpose. And yet, he's still in the depths of his heart. He's kind of searching for something. And that's why when he turned and he saw this burning bush in the middle of his day, doing honest work, shepherding the flock, he turns and he sees this bush. And, and it wasn't uncommon that a bush would be on fire, but what was uncommon is that the bush wasn't consumed. And so there was this, this slight awareness that, Moses had to turn aside and look at it and, and actually pursue it and to go for it. And that's why we just read in Scripture that, that when God saw that Moses had turned aside, that's when the, God started speaking to him. And I believe some of us are just, like, God is just waiting for some of us to actually just, just turn aside a little bit, to, like, stop and just be aware of a greater thing that might be communicated to us through God in that given moment, right where you're at. And when God speaks, like he spoke to Moses, he says, you're now in my presence, and this is holy ground. I also believe that there's holy ground right where we're at t today because of Christ Jesus. As we read in Hebrews, that we have this confidence to enter into the throne room of God. We have confidence to enter into the throne of grace because of Christ Jesus. Can you put up Romans 5, 2 for me, please? It's through him, through Jesus Christ, we also have obtained access by what? Faith. Faith is what gives us access into this grace in which we stand. Through our believing, we have access to God, and we actually get to stand in the grace of God. So right where you're at, you can, you can take off your sandals and call it holy ground because that's where the Lord's found, right where you're at because of Christ Jesus. And what I don't want is for us to miss it because it's, 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 it's easy to miss. It'd be easy if Moses said, I'm just, if he was just tunnel visioned on the flock, but he stopped. And he looked and he turned aside. I have to believe in my heart of hearts that Moses was, was looking to find the grace of God, looking to find the favor of God, looking to find the presence of God in a new way, in a deeper way in his life. And it's at that time when God called him that he revealed really what his heart needed.
I believe that there's these burning bush moments like all around us where God is speaking to you. He's leading you into speaking more of your identity, more of your calling in this season of life for you. But it's going to take you to just be aware of it you and I to be aware of it, to turn aside and to actually pursue it. That's what I'm talking about by finding the grace. Find the grace. And, and, and you're in a tough situation. You can stop and say, I'm going to take my sandals off, God. This is holy ground where we're at because I know you're here in me. I'm the temple. You live in me now through my faith. Where's the favor? Where's the favor here in this situation? Where's the grace? Where's your ability to do something in my life that I could not do on my own right now? You're in a tough conversation with somebody. You're feeling a little bit angry. You're feeling hurt. God, I need you right now. Where's the grace? I got to go find it. Because I'm feeling really upset right now. I'm feeling really discouraged right now. I'm not feeling like myself right now. I'm not feeling like I'm called right now. I'm not feeling holy right now. Take the sandals off and declare it as holy ground, and you say, God, let's find it. Where's it at, God? Because I know it's here. I know it's here. One of the greatest promises that God has given and will give continuously is that his presence will be with us. That's why he's told Moses, he said, That's, this is going to be the sign that I'm with you, that I'm, it, my presence is with you. I also believe that not only are those burning bush moments available for us today in Christ, it's just like they're just all around, but I believe that you are going to be a burning bush moment for somebody else where they've never heard the voice of God. And then they come in contact with you and they start hearing the heart of the Father. They start hearing about their calling. They start hearing about the, the mission that God has, which is to deliver people. They start seeing about what it looks like for someone who is least likely, as you share your testimony with them, for God to use you because you said yes to work in and through your life to partake in what he's desired and destined. And you can think of all the excuses that don't qualify you for this calling and this big thing that is still yet ahead in your life. And God says, but that's grace. That's my ability to do something in your life that you could not do on your own. And it's because of my favor that's going to be with you, my grace that's going to be with you, that everybody else will get to see that you're mine. So the mission is still the same today. I will say, take moments throughout this week. And don't forget what I'm saying. Take moments throughout this week to think with the mind of Christ. See, because now you can think with the Father. You can share thoughts with the Father because the Holy Spirit's in you. And you can ask, where's, where's the grace here? Father, where's the grace? Where's the grace here? I want to find it. I want to find it when I enter this room. Where's your favor in this room? Where's the grace here? Where's the, that, that, that bubble of peace in a chaotic situation? It's available. God, where's it at? Help me find the grace here. Help me find your grace here. Help me find where it's holy ground. And let me just take my sandals off and declare it that, yes, I'm in agreement. You are here with me no matter where I'm at. If you receive it, say amen. amen. All right. Drew, man, lead us out of here.